please welcome Dr. Chichi Alonzo Moma. My name is Chi Chi Alonzo Moma. I am a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, a sister, a pharmacist, and the proud owner of Springfield Pharmacy. <laughs> a small business located right here in Delaware County since 2012. I am an active member of Delco community and passionate about advocating for the best health care possible for the patients of Delaware County. We are Delco strong, right? As a daughter of immigrant parents, I experienced firsthand the importance of hard work and perseverance. Through this, I was inspired to become a doctor of pharmacy and a business owner. I was inspired by the American dream. Now, I have a mission to contribute to this country by advocating for my patients. I constantly fight for lower drug costs, bridging healthcare gaps, standing up to the middlemen, the prescription benefit managers, and big corporations, all to support and give back to our community. Over the past two years, I have seen countless patients struggle to pay for basic medications like insulin and vaccines, but we have an ally in President Joe Biden. The $35 insulin program and the no-cost vaccine program have been lifelines for patients through his inflation Reduction Act. So that's awesome. That is awesome. Also, through President Biden's work to improve our economy, we've been able to create new jobs in my business, helping other members of our community to obtain gainful employment. I am grateful for everything this administration is doing to tackle health care costs, help small businesses, help minority business owners like myself, and I look forward to re-electing President Biden to finish the job. So now everyone, it is my honor, my pleasure, to introduce to you the First Lady of the United States, Dr. Jill Biden, and the President, Joe Biden. Dr. Moma for that introduction and for sharing your story with us. So, did you all see Joe last night? <laughs> Wasn't he on fire? I was so proud of him. You know, he gave such a strong speech and set out a clear vision of where we've been and where we're going. So it's great to be home. As most of you know, I'm a Philly girl. 
so I grew up in Willow Grove, just north of the city. And probably like most of you, I spent my summers watching the Phillies with my dad. And of course, in the fall, we, all, we were always watching football and the Eagles. Yes. And speaking of the Eagles, can we give Jason Kelsey a round of applause? him, aren't we? Yeah. So last night, Joe showed the world what I see every day. It's what drew me to him when we first met, I think, honest to God, Joe, 50 years ago. <laughs> <At that time>. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, he was a heartbroken father who had endured unspeakable tragedy but he was, you know, keeping it together for our family. The senator who put one foot in front of the other because he knew his constituents were counting on him. The man who placed his faith in a power greater than himself because when you go through that type of pain, there's no choice but to recognize your powerlessness in the face of God's prov providence. Joe rebuilt our family with compassion, love, and strength. And as your president, he's rebuilt our nation with that same character. <laughs> Joe knows how serious the stakes are in this election. Courts that are stripping away our most basic freedoms MAGA Republicans that are trying to drag us back to a dark and dangerous place. <laughs> Extremists waging battles over our bodies, our choices, and our futures. We are the first generation in half a century to give our daughters a country with fewer rights than we had. <laughs> Joe is working tirelessly to defend our freedoms, our future, and our democracy. I wouldn't wish the tragic events of the last several months on any American president, but I'm so grateful that Joe is our president during these uncertain, tumultuous times. person for this job. He is the only person for this job. Joe wakes up every morning thinking about he, how he can make the lives of Americans better. Donald Trump wakes up every morning caring about one person, and one person only, himself. He tears people down and pits us against one another. He mocks women's bodies and devalues our existence. And here's the one thing that really gets my filly up. As the daughter of a World War II veteran, Navy veteran, and the mother of an Army soldier, Donald Trump insults our veterans and disparages those who died in war calling them losers and suckers. How dare he? <laughs> Donald Trump is dangerous to women and to our families and to our country. And we can't let him win. <laughs> we can't wake up the day after the election like we did in 2016. Terrified of the future ahead of us, thinking, oh my God, what just happened? What are we going to do now? No, we must meet this moment as if our rights are at stake, because they are. If our 
democracy is on the line because it is. We must reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. <laughs> and that starts here in this room with all of you. So please help me welcome my husband, the 46th President of the United States, Joe Biden. I think I should go home now. Hello, Delco. I'm Joe Biden. I'm Joe Biden's husband. And thanks to the elected officials here today, including someone I keep telling her I think we're related. We come from the, our families come from the same county in Ireland. Representative Scanlon, where is she? There you are. He's doing a hell of a job representing this district. Yeah. If you're tired, you probably watched my address last night. <laughs> I got my usual warm reception from Congressman Marjorie Taylor Greene. In my address, I spoke about how far we've come since we took office. And I talked about how much is at stake. Folks, our freedoms really are on the ballot this November. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans are trying to take away our freedoms. That's not an exaggeration. Well, guess what? We will not let him. We will not let him. Last night, in the U.S. Capitol, the same building where our freedoms came under assault on July the 6th, excuse me, January the 6th, we talked about another Alabama. Fourteen months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to another Alabama, thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have a second child, but the Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state, unleashed by the U.S. Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait. What her family has gone through should never have happened. And folks, you know why it happened? I'll tell you why. One reason, Donald Trump. He came to office determined to overturn Roe v. Wade. In fact, he's bragged about it repeatedly, that he's the reason it got overturned. He got his wish. And states are passing bans, criminalizing doctors, forcing rape and incest victims to leave their state to get care. And now, MAGA Republicans and Donald Trump want to pass a national ban on the right to choose, period. Well, take it seriously, folks, because they, that's what they're still heading for. Hear me loud and clear. This will not happen on my watch. The decision, the decision to over. Thank you. The decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court majority wrote, women are not without electoral power or political power. Clearly, these bragging. Anyway, <laughs> those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women in America. No clue. They found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot in 2022 and 2023, and they'll find out again in 2024. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart when I say I thank Vice President Harris for leading on this issue and so many others. 
You know, in Pennsylvania, I have a message for you. Send me to Congress that I can support this right, and I promise you, if we take back Congress, we, we will restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land. Look, I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in our nation's history. And we have. I inherited an economy that was, was on the brink, excuse me. Now our economy is the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years. That's a record in American history. <laughs> Unemployment hit a 50-year low. 800,000 new manufacturing jobs and counting. As I said when I started, where is it written that we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world again? Wages are up and inflation is coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9 percent to 3 percent. We made so much progress, so now let's talk about the future we can build because we have more to do. Look, the future where the days of trickle-down economics are over and the wealthy, the biggest corporations, begin to pay their fair share. God love them. For example, Americans pay more, as the pharmacist can tell us, the doc can tell us, for prescription drugs than anywhere else in the world. It's wrong. And I've been fighting the pharmaceutical industry since I was in the Senate for over 30 years. But guess what? We're ending it. In the law I proposed and signed, no one not one Republican voted for it, but we finally beat Big Pharma. Instead of paying $400 a month, for example, on insulin for seniors, they only have to pay 35 bucks. And by the way, it only costs $10 to make. They're still paying. They're, they're still getting a big profit. But look, I'm not stopping there. Let's cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for every American who needs it, not just seniors. I finally beat Big Pharma, and now we're giving Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for prescription drugs, just like the VA does for our military. This doesn't just save seniors money. It's saving taxpayers billions of dollars, cutting the deficit. Now it's time to give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for even more drugs. You know, it's going to save the taxpayers another $200 billion. We already saved $160 billion off your taxes because the Medicare doesn't have to pay that bill. Folks, starting next year, the bill I got passed, we're capping the total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 a year, even for expensive cancer drugs that cost 10, 12, 14, 15,000 a year. And my goal next year, let's do that for all of America. All of America. Let's cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year for everyone. And folks, the Affordable Care Act is still a very big deal. Over 100 million Americans can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre existing conditions. But Donald Trump has announced he wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And his Republican colleagues tried 49 other times in the last since Obamacare was passed, but it's not going to happen on my watch. Look, I'm also working to bring down the cost of housing. I'm proposing an annual tax credit that will give Americans $400 a month over the next two years to put toward their mortgage if they are buying for the first home or if, in fact, they're moving to a larger place because they're afraid they're going to lose the mortgage rate they have. But guess what? I can't guarantee it, but I bet you, I bet you the rates come down more because I bet you that that little outfit that sets interest rates, it's going to come down. It's going to come down. And folks, we're cracking down on big landlords who break antitrust laws by price fixing and driving up rents. Now Congress needs to pass my plan to build and renovate 2 million affordable homes and apartments and bring those rents down. And by the way, 
A lot of my public expenses, that's cost a lot of money raising the deficit. Guess what? We cut the deficit. They cut the deficit. One trillion dollars. The last guy ballooned the deficit. We passed a budget deal that will cut another trillion dollars over the next decade. They kept trying to get out of it, but they finally agreed. And now it's my goal to cut the federal deficit by three billion more, three trillion more by making big corporations very wealthy. And I'm a capitalist, by the way. You can go make a million bucks, you make a billion, good for you. But pay your taxes. We have a thousand billionaires in America. A thousand. Guess how much their what their tax rate is? Eight point three percent. Anybody want to change the tax rate with them? I'm just to think about that. Eight point three percent. Billionaire. Donald Trump, you sure in hell do. <laughs> Look, Donald Trump enacted a $2 trillion tax cut when he was president, overwhelmingly benefiting the very wealthy, and exploded the federal deficit, exploded it. We cut the deficit, and we added more to the national debt than any president in his term in all of history, and under Donald Trump. These guys talk about, oh. Too many corporations raise their prices and pad their profits, charging you more and more for less and less. That's why we're cracking down on corporations engaged in price gouging and deceptive pricing. Looks like companies that, uh, that you wouldn't notice, they thought you wouldn't notice, but you know, if you're a, they give you the same size bag of potato chips, with about 20% fewer potato chips. In it. No, by the way, that's not a joke. Some of you may have seen there was a, a, a TV thing on how uh, Snickers bars, same exact price with, uh, some, don't hold me the exact number, but like 20% less bar. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Congress needs to sign Bobby Casey's bill to stop shrinkflation. Stop it. These are a family I grew up in. These are kitchen table issues. I'm also getting junk fees for those hidden fees added at the end of your bills without your knowledge. My administration just announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. And by the way, I'm not being arbitrary. The law says they can charge for late fee when it costs them to collect it. It does not cost anywhere near $32, but they make over time, over that period, billions of dollars. Literally, it stunned me. You got 450,000 people paying those late fees. And they charge this over, they end up paying over $2 billion. The banks and credit card companies don't like it. Why? I'm saving American families $20 billion a year with those junk fees by eliminating. $20 billion. And, and by the way, I grew up in, I grew up in Scranton and Claymont, Delaware. They're the two places I grew up. And you know what? It made a difference in my household if you had to pay an extra 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, you think? It wasn't fair. It matters, and so does this. Folks, does anybody think the tax code is fair? No, no I, I mean it. I'm serious. I don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Under my plan, nobody making less than $400,000 a year, which I've never made, until I became president. <laughs> we'll pay one penny in additional tax. Nobody, not one penny. A big corporation, big corporations will finally have to begin to pay their fair share. No, really, this is just fairness. It's about fairness and decency. This is not a, we're not making this stuff up. In 2020, 50, you may remember, this was a big fight I had with the Republicans. In 2020, 55 of the largest corporations in America made $40 billion in profit and paid zero in federal taxes. Well, I was determined to change that. And guess what? Not anymore. Thanks to the law I wrote and signed, big companies now have to pay a minimum of 15%. It's only 15%. Still less than working people pay in federal taxes. This time, 
We're going to raise the minimum tax to corporations at least 21 percent. And so every billion-dollar corporation finally begins to pay their fair share. Look, I want to end tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, corporate jets, massive executive pay that gets deducted. Look, as I said, there are 1,000 billionaires in America, and their federal tax rate is 8.2 percent. I said three before. That's far less than the vast majority of you pay. No billionaire should pay a lower tax than a teacher, a sanitation worker, a nurse. No, I mean, that's why I propose not the highest tax, the minimum tax of 25 percent for billionaires. Just 25. And guess what? You know how much money that would raise over the next 10 years? $500 billion. And imagine what that could do for America and for our future. It could cut the deficit. It could provide for child care. I mean, there's so much that we need to do and not raise the deficit. But let's invest in — and let's continue to invest in the future by confronting the climate crisis, not denying it. I don't know. <laughs> e e Since I've been President, I've gone with the — with all the folks from my administration. I've flown over those wildfires out west and in the northwest and the southwest. I've literally in the helicopter, all of them. And guess what? It's burned down more timber and more housing than comprises the entire state of Maryland. We're taking the most significant action of climate ever in the history of the world. They said I couldn't get it passed. We got $369 billion passed for climate change. And still cut the deficit. And America is safe. America is safer today than I took office. The year before I took office, murder rates went up to 30 percent nationwide, the biggest increase in American history under the last guy. And now, through the American Rescue Plan, which every Republican voted against, I might add, I made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year, murder rates saw the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime led fell to one of the lowest levels more than in more than 50 years. I'm ramping up federal enforcement to violence, to, for the Violence Against Women Act, which I proudly wrote, so we can finally end the scourge of violence against women. <laughs> These guys fought taking away guns from domestic abusers. I mean, I don't know where they — we beat the NRA when I proposed and signed the most significant gun safety law in 30 years. Now we have to beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. I did it once. And passed universal background checks. Repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers. They look. Imagine if — imagine if tobacco had the same limitations companies that gun manufacturers. The only major corporation in America — industry in America that you cannot sue is gun manufacturers. Think about that. Imagine if that had been the case with tobacco. How many more people would be dying of cancer? Look, there's a lot more to say, but I'm keeping you standing too long. I know <laughs> — I know. I know. I was watching on television last night about 2 in the morning after we got back to the house. <laughs> the house, the White House. Still think of it, hard to think of it as home. <laughs> I, uh, I had the TV on, and there was a Fox News commentator saying, you know, Biden is changing from trickle-down economics to build from the middle out and the bottom up. It's going to ruin America. 
ruin America. We have the strongest economy in the world right now. Like I said, like I said, and I mean this sincerely, and I believed it my whole career, finally got it done. If we focus on the middle class, first of all, first of all, they're the, they're the heart and soul and sinew of the country. If you focus on them and give them an even chance, the poor have a way up, and the wealthy still do very, very well. Still do very well. As I said, I'm a capitalist. But capitalism, when it turns to engaged in non-competition, it ends up being just stealing. Well, let me close with this. I know you're thinking, that I couldn't have been around very long. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clear, but never before. I know the American story. I've seen it again and again in contests between competing forces for the battle for the soul of this nation. Some of you may remember when I ran in 2020, I got criticized by the press for saying I was running for three reasons. One, to restore the soul of America. Two, to build the middle class so we can begin to grow again and everybody have an even chance. And three, to unite the country. They're still my goals. They're still my goals. Well, thank you. Because the soul of the country is who we are. Look, you know, did you ever think, those of you who are over 40, did you ever think we'd be in a situation where we talk to each other like we talk these days? Why you see things that we see that no matter how tense things were, and they were really tough in other parts of our history, when you ride down the street and there was a Trump banner with a FU on it and a little, and a six-year-old kid putting up his middle finger, did you ever say, no, I'm serious. Did you ever think you'd hear people talk the way they do? Look, it demeans, it demeans who we are. That's not who America, that's not America. Those between, those, look, those of us who want to pull America back at the past and those who want to move it into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace the future. I mean it sincerely, freedom, democracy future based on the core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, fairness, equality, just treating people just fairly. No, I really mean it. We don't always live up, but that, that, that's the American creed. Donald Trump sees the story differently. He sees a story of resentment, revenge, retribution. I've been working like hell to unite Europe, NATO, make sure Ukraine doesn't get crushed by this dictator in Russia. But you know, the fact is that you have a president who literally is invited Putin to do what it wants, do what the hell it wants if it to come into Ukraine. He thinks Putin is a strong Basically, he's a decent guy. You know who he's meeting with today and down in Mar-a-Lago? Orban of Hungary, who stated flatly he doesn't think democracy works. He's looking for dictatorship. The only member of NATO. That's who he's meeting with. I see a future where we defend democracy, not diminish it. I see a future. We defend our freedom, not take them away. I see a future of the middle class has a fair shot and the wealthy pay their fair share. And I see a future where the planet move from the climate crisis in our country away from the gun violence that we have so much. I see a future where America remains the beacon of the world. I've been doing foreign policy since I was a kid in the Senate. I was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and I've gone now, I spent over almost 200 hours with the leaders of Europe, the heads of state. I know them all. I've known them well. 
And guess what? You know what every one of them says to me virtually except Orban? <laughs> I'm serious. As we leave these meetings, well, indirectly, they grab my arm and they pull me aside. I'm serious. They pull me aside and say, you've got to, you can't win again. Because my democracy, meaning their country, my democracy is at stake. My democracy is at stake. <laughs> Folks, above all I see, a country for all Americans, a future for all of Americans, a presidency for all of Americans. Because I believe in America, I believe in you, the American people. We just have to remember who in hell we are. We are the United States of America. And there's nothing, nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you. talked about how she fell in love with me. I, I had to ask this woman five times to marry me. Five. And finally, the fifth time, I was down in South Africa trying to see Nelson Mandela when I was a senator. I came back to her apartment in, in Wilmington, Delaware, and I got off the plane. I knocked on the door. I said, Jill, you got my Irish up. I'm asking you one more time. <laughs> Only one more time. Not when, but will you marry me? She goes like this. Okay. <laughs> I tell you what, she did it. Married a Philly girl. <laughs>